Uh, Joe Kinzer is our guest here. He is the assistant prosecuting attorney in Berkeley County, a candidate for the prosecuting attorney position now that uh, the current prosecutor is moving on to a race for judge. Joe, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming in, man. Hey, in the state, the jail concerns have reached what some have called crisis levels with National Guard troops stationed in certain positions uh, with the salaries of the employees, the shortage of guards that we have, and they're trying to tackle that problem in Charleston during this a special session that was called by the governor. You've got intimate knowledge with this because you work so much, obviously, with those who are being sentenced into the jails, and you're aware of what's the situation from your end. So can you give us a little insight there? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I have heard that the legislature is trying to address this right now in the special session. I don't know what will come of that, but um, I'll agree and say it is a crisis. Uh, we deal – so the Berkeley County Prosecutor, Prosecutor's Office – prosecutes all crime in Berkeley County. And within Berkeley County on Grapevine Road is the Eastern Regional Jail. So any crime that actually occurs at the jail, we prosecute as well. It's an entirely separate, uh, normally type, you know, style of case that we have. But those get funneled through our office and they, they have for a long time. And we, the grand jury meets um, in Berkeley County three times a year. And at every grand jury, we are indicting felony cases out of the Eastern Regional Jail, and it has been that way for years. It's Even before this crisis, there's always been crime at the jail. How much of a problem is crime at the jail? It is an incredible problem um, because it is mostly centered around uh, controlled substances, um, so drugs. But with drugs, both inside and outside of the jail come violence, and we see a lot of that. I actually just uh, prosecuted a case in July with uh, Ray Boyce, another assistant prosecutor in the office, that was a uh, malicious wounding and a conspiracy to commit malicious wounding. Um, an individual was supposed to secret drugs on his person and bring them into the jail when he got arrested, and he because the, the street value of drugs in the jail is astronomical. So on the street, it may be worth $5 for this particular amount of drugs. In there, it could be worth $1,500 because supply and demand. So people will secret drugs into the jail, and then once they're in there, it is, it is a currency, and it is fought after. And the, what the case that we had, the gentleman did not bring it in as he was supposed to. Um, and so there was essentially a hit ordered in the jail, and he was, uh, this individual was beaten so bad that it, uh, they knocked his teeth out. Um, they pulled him into a cell, multiple men jumped him, um, and they were paid for what they did um there's a lot of a lot of money that floats around you'd be you'd be surprised there's a lot of money so the obvious question is how was this stuff getting in there and in- Including cash. How was the? How are the drugs and cash getting into the jail? Sure. So the drugs they can get really creative. Um, I I've worked some cases and for the past several years I've been assigned most of the cases out of the jail, um, and so they can get creative of. of throwing stuff over the fence, driving by on Grapevine Road, finding a particular spot, having it prearranged where they throw the drugs over. Um, I'm working a case right now where a window was broken out at the jail uh, that was not seen by staff. You know, they're understaffed. Um, And they were, they made, you know, a a rope out of sheets and sent it out there and the person put the drugs in there and they pulled it back in. Uh, And that worked a couple times before that was discovered. the most common way, however, is uh, in in body cavities. Uh, they, they they bring it in on their person. They either eat it or or it comes in the other way, and uh, then they now there's full body scanners at the jail, so they catch a lot of it now. But they who are we talking about visitors to the prisoners? No, we are talking about or? the prisoners themselves. Well, and I'll get to staff, but yeah. pri- the prisoners themselves, if they if they know they have a warrant, if they've been to jail, if they you know, and, and a lot of this can get prearranged. They know they'll turn themselves in, um, and when they turn themselves in, they before they do that, they will load themselves up um, to go into the jail and hope that they're not detected at the front. But one of the problems with the staffing issues, I'm glad you brought that up, is that the, you know, I've talked with the admin guys at the jail, and the quality of applicants that they get to fill these positions is not what it once was because folks can go to to Maryland or Virginia and make um, nearly nearly double in some circumstances what the Eastern Regional Jail offers so you're you're getting folks who are not getting paid a lot and then an inmate says hey 
if you bring in this for me, if you meet this guy and you bring as a CEO, you bring this in, I'll give you 1500 bucks. And a lot of them succumb to that. I mean, there's investigations right now. Um, you know, we, and we do prosecute guards who, who do that, who commit crime and they, they flip and they work for the inmates to bring stuff in. Um, so it's tough. Is it getting worse, Joe? Yes, I do. I, I believe it's getting worse. Um, you know, there's, I'm going to say that the Eastern Panhandle Drug and Violent Crimes Task Force has had their hand in investigating crime at the jail for probably close to 10 years. But I want to say in 2017 or 2018, they exclusively put investigator Brian Bean at the jail. And he is, um, he's a legend in the law enforcement community. He is a, a wonderful investigator and he is solely based out of the jail and has been for years now. And, and really the way it works, if you think about it, you know, people in jail, they can get in trouble for small things, you know, Hey, you're not supposed to have that contraband or, Hey, you use someone else's phone pin to, to call out. And they handle those internally for the most part. But when it crosses over to, Hey, this is a criminal offense. That's when they call in, um, Brian Bean to do an investigation, and then he forwards the case to us. Let me go back to the fact, to the question that it's increasing through time or is more prevalent today. Yes. Uh, we've had drugs in the area for quite a while. Yes. Uh, so I don't know if there's an increase in drugs availability or not. Right. Uh, but it kind of circles back to our staffing and the fact that we have not paid enough. That's been uh, been addressed by the governor and the legislators this last session. Yes. Uh, how much does that come into play, that we we have problems with the getting the right corrections folks in place? Well, it's uh, that that's huge. So, you know, right now I think they just re-upped for another year the National Guard to help out. Which, oh, they did? Yes, which is um, – Necessary, You know, when you talk to this, it, the system would not work at all at this point if it weren't for the guardsmen. I think that they're at around 50 to 55 percent staffed uh, when you don't count the guardsmen. Um, and, you know, I've these guys have directly told me that the applicants that they are hiring now even would not have even got an interview 10 years ago. They just wouldn't have. Okay, go uh, with the with the guard very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, they do not; their jobs do not have them in direct contact with the inmates. Or well, do they? For, oh, for the national guard, national that's guard. correct. Yeah, that is correct. So, so we're talking about the possible providing the uh, the prisoners or the inmates with with drugs. If it is staff, mm -hmm. it would not be the coast guard. I mean, it would not be the the guard staff. That's correct. Yeah. I have not uh, I have not indicted or, yeah. or been aware, aware yeah. of any investigations yeah. on the guard uh, staff. Bill and I were talking uh, off mic uh, earlier. Uh, apparently, the legislature did pass uh, a pay increase last night, late last night, did for they? for the uh, guards. And I think it's somewhere around 4500 to 5000 uh, uh, for both uniform for and non-uniform, okay. right? And and that that would be over a two-year period, half the first year and half the second year into their base budget. Do you think that is enough? Because I remember you, uh, you said a little bit ago that you thought maybe they could go to uh, nearby jurisdictions and get twice as much. Do you yeah. think that five thousand would be enough to uh, to, to 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 keep the to, to keep uh, the staffing levels at what is required. You know, I guess only time will tell yeah. if it's enough. I I don't know, and even outside of corrections, I mean, the availability of you know, Amazon, P and G, uh, going Rustolium up in Hagerstown, places where people can drive uh, really quick. I know. Let me see. I want to say down in uh, Virginia, they, yeah. I want to say that their salaries for um, for corrections officers mm -hmm. in this field is in the uh, upper 50s or something like that. And I think right now our starting was 34. Well, with that upper 50s, would that be starting? Are you comparing apples to apples here? I yeah, I, that's that's how it was relayed to me. Okay. The, okay. The, yeah. now, and that included, I think, for a first year, maybe like a, a, a five plus thousand dollar sign on bonus or something so that might not have been all salary but it was still up you know significantly higher so i, I don't know would would five grant it wouldn't hurt sure <laughs> sure i could tell you that and um oh and also bill you mentioned the ways that the drugs can get into yeah. the jail one of the really interesting ones that i completely forgot about when you asked was uh we katie and i were trying a murder case um a while back i want to say it was 2022 
And, you know, when a person is incarcerated and they go to trial, they don't show up in their orange, you know, garb. There's plenty of science to that, that the jury's going to look at them as a criminal if they're Mm -hmm. wearing the jumpsuit. So they get to wear court clothes. And um, normally the way that's arranged is the family of the defendant will bring them court clothes so that they can get dressed up before court and then the jury doesn't know that they're incarcerated. Um, we had an instance where they, the, the family members took Suboxone strips, which is a, a, a controlled substance, it's an opiate, and they sewed it into <laughs> the pants of the defendant's, uh, the, of his court pants. And uh, the jail caught it, uh, which was really impressive. Um, but it was, I want to say, like 75 strips. Yeah. And just to give you a reference to value on the inside, those strips, depending on supply and demand, can go from about 500 to $1,500 a strip. Do we have scans that will pick that up, body scans will pick it up, or is that done literally by physical observation? We, we have, uh, the jail does have body scanners now that can can pick that up but it still it still finds its way in sometimes yeah. i don't know if every i mean the jail does so many numbers uh, people coming in i uh, inmates i'm not sure if they body scan everyone or if it's just if they have a hunch they body scan uh, i'm not sure what the policy is on that for a long time uh, the uh, uh, a large part of the overcrowding of the regional jails was because of overcrowding in the prison system and the prison system was farming out uh, inmates that were supposed to be in the prison system, right. and therefore getting the benefit of, uh, of of things like education and all that, people who were longer term, right. they were being farmed out to the regional jails where you didn't have those kinds of services. Right. Is that still a problem? Not like it was. Okay. And, and it was, and it was less of a farming out and more of a waiting so long to get them classified and moved. You know, you'd have someone who was sentenced to prison who was sitting at the Eastern Regional Jail mm-hmm. for a year after that, you know, and um, which was also really frustrating, I think, for the people at the jail when the prison that's right next door was empty halls and, and everything else, and you've got three, four people in a cell over here. Uh, but that is not – that that has been remedied, I do believe. Okay, uh, great. We don't have great. that issue that we used to have. Thanks. Yeah. Joe, do you know much about this lawsuit that was filed in federal court in the Southern District and named uh, Jim Justice as well as other uh, state officials – uh, it's uh, $270 million in deferred maintenance at the jails. They're seeking injunctive relief. Uh, also, uh, at least $60 million to fill uh, worker vacancies. It was just filed, uh, as I said yesterday, hit yeah. the legislature on their last day of the session. And they're talking about 10,000. It says the lawsuit alleges approximately 10,000 state inmates are living in inhumane conditions. Uh, the state needs to spend $270 million to address deferred maintenance and they only put forth a bill to do 25 million dollars of that in this uh, most recent legislation that they dealt with in this special session uh steven new is the attorney uh, who's handling this case yeah. who's does it what plaintiff is listed i have not heard of this um it's on behalf um of, let me see here it says here Beckley attorney Stephen New, who represents the plaintiffs in the case, said part of the lawsuit is based on information provided by current and former members of the Justice Administration. Uh, I don't see any information as to... Named plaintiffs? Named plaintiffs here, too. I think if you probably go further in the story, it might... uh, The lawsuit was filed on behalf of Mount Olive State Prison inmate Thomas Shepard, regional jail inmate Tyler Randall, and a juvenile inmate in one of the state's juvenile facilities. The lawsuit seeks class action status. Well, I know that um, in in prosecuting cases and, and having to, um, you know, obviously I don't go out to the jail as much. Uh, I will go out to uh, debrief individuals or meet with uh, the admin staff at the jail. But, you know, defense attorneys for years, and it has really ramped up in the past several years, have been uh, making these arguments, uh, making, you know, cruel and unusual punishment arguments about the uh, – the situation at the jail, and I, it, it certainly is overcrowded. I'm not surprised to hear that there's a class action lawsuit. But but if I can pick up on that, we hear so much about the corrections, the salaries, and the staff. And we don't hear very much about deferred maintenance in the jail. Yeah. Uh, how bad are the jails in terms of maintenance? Of and maintenance. I'll speak only our jail here. Sure. Our, our jail here, I know um, it's not a complaint that I've heard about from the admin staff. Yeah. And maybe that's just putting out fires, that they're yeah. more um, more concerned with addressing the issues of, of staffing and overcrowding and what the inmates are doing in the crime and that, that I don't hear about the, um, the maintenance. I know um, 
in several of the cases that I have been prosecuting, there's been damage to the facility, but to my knowledge, it's been repaired upon upon completion. So I'm not familiar with that. So that may not be a statewide issue, at least not as uh, not true. appear as much as what would be in other parts. Of no, the state. certainly the overcrowding yeah. is though. The apparently. overcrowding certainly. is, but, but yeah. they're talking about deferred maintenance, and that's the aspect that I'm. Yeah, I I, up I on. think it yeah. is a serious problem in the one in Kanawha County. And then, and in a couple of others, there have been uh, regular complaints that you hear. But yeah, I don't think it's a system wide. It's just uh, maybe not really good management yeah. <laughs> in certain jails. Sure, Joe. How many of the counties in the state have a day report center or uh, any type of uh, work release or uh, confinement to the home as a program to help cut down on jail costs and ease overcrowding? Sure. Well, I know uh, many of them would if they felt that they could afford it. Uh, I know we hear from that from other counties, um, that they look to what we're doing and how we've been able to address that. And and the the issue is it's money on the front end, and a lot of counties don't have that. Like we, Berkeley County has been able, with an investment on the front end, to get something like Day Report Center going that ultimately, uh, through the, the savings to the jail bill, does pay for itself. But it's really hard, I think, for smaller counties to have that ability to, to start a program like that. Joe, you mentioned earlier that your your office prosecutes crimes that happens inside the regional jail. Yes. What about the city itself? Uh, do you prosecute those crimes in, that happen in the city? Absolutely. Okay. Now, it's um, city officers, I believe, when they when they charge an offense or they write a citation, they can designate whether it's going to go to city court um, through that beautiful new facility that they have yeah. there, uh, or whether it's going to go into the Berkeley County Magistrate Court, where our office would pick it up and, and prosecute it from there. I was struck, and we'll talk to uh, Jason Barrett about this later, one of the actions that the uh, uh, the legislators took yesterday was to extend the the ability of the, uh, of the county to charge the city up to five days for uh, for housing a uh, an inmate or criminal, however, that only applies to cities with forty thousand people or more. So that's <laughs> probably, and I don't know the number, but certainly that excludes Martinsburg. I would think. Yeah, well, it's only two cities. It's Charleston yeah. and Huntington. So, yeah, yeah, but it, but it's a real need. That's something I've been hearing for years yeah. that the uh, uh, that the city is ba- uh, city is kind of skating on this, and right. the county's picking up all the expenses, picking up the tab. Yeah, yeah. just got a text from uh, Leader Eric Halsolder who says that a FY twenty four budget that passed this year had ninety five million for deferred maintenance for corrections. That's uh, about a third of what the suit is claiming is necessary, mm-hmm. but it's more than the $25 million that's mentioned in the article. And, that's sure. and maybe Eric can also wade in the fact that we've uh, uh, that it's only cities of 40000 or more that's, that you, this extended re, uh, reimbursement period. Right. Yeah. Joe, how long does the average inmate stay at the Eastern Regional Jail before either being moved on to another prison or released? There are so many variables. You know, it's the... The tried and true lawyer answer, it depends. Um, That's Ken know. Apple's answer, too. I mean, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> but it really does. Uh, it depends on, you know, first their ability to make bond, um, what the bond is set at. And, and the legislative uh, amendments within the past year or so to try to address bond and having people um, be able to, if they've not bonded out after a certain amount of time, they get another hearing automatically with the magistrate to try to, to try to reduce that bond and make it something that they can make. Uh, so that's a huge factor. And also, a lot of people get released on bond, and then we have to revoke their bond. If they commit another criminal offense or if if it's like a domestic case and, you know, hey, you, you as a condition of your bond, you cannot be around this young woman um, or whoever it is, and they violate that, well, then the judge says, well, you had bond. I gave you the chance to be out, and now you don't have it anymore. And so they revoke the bond, and the person goes back to the Eastern Regional Jail. And depending on the type of case it is and where it, you know, where it is in the case, if it's a misdemeanor, you know, they can, they can probably spend a few months there before, um, before they get out. If it's a felony case and it's not even been presented to the grand jury yet, I mean, there are times when people spend years in our Eastern Regional Jail waiting well, to resolve their case. I know the number is fluid, but generally speaking, what's the count there? What's the census? Oh, goodness. Katie gave me these numbers not long ago, and I can't, I don't want to misstate them. I don't want to misstate them off the top of my head. But I know that, um, you know, we... As is Berkeley it hundreds? County, thousand? I mean, what, what... The numbers of people in the jail? Yeah. Ah, gosh, Rob, I really don't know off the top of my head. I I know that we've, when I was looking at the chart, 
that we were provided. I mean, obviously, Berkeley County puts a, has a, a large chunk of it, you know, percentage-wise, in the Eastern Regional Jail. Between Morgan and Jefferson County, Berkeley um, has the most people. But uh, we also, I think, do, as you've noted, a really fantastic job of trying to use these other means to get people out of jail, especially if, if they need treatment, if they can utilize the Day Report Center or Mountaineer Recovery Center, um, we, we really try to do what we can to reduce that number. Uh, Matt Harvey just uh, sent a text. It's 4,000 cities, oh, for not 40,000, but still 4,000. But still, not, that's, that's not the number in the jail. That's the city count you're talking about. That's the city about. count. So, in other words, Martinsburg still uh, would not pay. There's still one day, I think, they can charge, not the five days that the, the new bill had. So, it's 4,000, not 40,000. But uh, Charlestown and Ransom would still have to. <laughs> I don't I mean No, that. I'm sorry. They're they're both over there. Yeah. Uh say Shepherdstown, Harpers Ferry, Bolivar, Hedgesville would still have it's to stay. Still. Okay. Yeah. Final question for Joe? Yeah, uh that's a nice looking hat. Uh Joe, uh, you want to talk about it? Sure, yes. I'm uh running for, for prosecutor. You guys mentioned it. Uh Katie is is running for judge and uh we've been out at the fair all week this week. Uh last night was great with the rodeo. My wife and I uh were able to um uh, be the judges for the horse costume contest, uh, and I was very much blown away by the talent of these young people here in Berkeley County. And we had a great uh, opportunity to meet a lot of wonderful people here in Berkeley County and get the message out um, that I'm tough, I'm fair, I'm experienced, and and I, I'm the right man for the job to be the next prosecutor. So, Joe, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you so much, Joe Kinzer, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney in the Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, running for. Would they, would they call it uh, head prosecuting attorney or just prosecuting attorney? You can call it whatever you want. I think everybody knows what it means. So thank you. Right. He's Appreciate a bad you. man. He's a bad, bad man. <laughs>